Thank you for joining today's webinar hosted by the Center for Research Inequality and Diversity. I'm Dr. Elena Doldor, co-director of uh, CRED, as we call it, the Center for Research Inequality and Diversity. Uh, we are based at Queen Mary University of London in the School of Business and Management. We are an interdisciplinary uh, research center who carries out um, impactful and critical research on multiple aspects of equality, diversity, and inclusion at work, um, including gender, race, sexuality, and diversity management. Um, we are over 30 academics and doctoral students. And today we are delighted to host Professor Marian Baird, who will talk to us about working arrangements um, and COVID-19 um, employee preferences and employer responses in Australia. Before I introduce Marian properly, I just want to share a few housekeeping rules. Uh, we have um, up to um, 40 minutes for the talk and um, about 20, 25 minutes for the Q&A session. So our event will finish at 10.45 a.m. UK time. And um, as we go throughout the event, um, everybody can submit questions using the Q&A &A, um, box function at the, in the bottom bar of Zoom. So please feel free to raise questions or comments throughout the talk um, in that uh, Q&A bar. And the Q&A segment will be uh, moderated by my colleague, Professor Jill Curtin, who is Professor of Employment Relations at Queen Mary University of London and our Dean of Research. Uh, Jill is uh, online. Jill, if you wanna say a quick hi, there you are. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I'm looking forward very much to this talk and your questions as well. Lovely, thank you. So, um, let me tell you just a few words about uh, Marian. She's a professor of uh, employment, um, of gender and employment relations um, and co-director of the Women and Work Research Group um, in the University of Sydney Business School. Um, our research center, CRED, um, and um, her research group have a long-standing relationship uh, that has materialized in joint research projects and um, visiting um, scholars um, going back and forth. Um, Marion is also a presiding uh, pro-chancellor um, of the University of Sydney. Marion's research focuses on gender and employment, in particular how regulation and social norms interact to produce different um, labor market outcomes for uh, men and women. She has won numerous grants from business and governments to study parental leave in Australia, gender equitable organizational change, women and economic development and work and family policy. She has contributed to um, government advisory boards and inquiries regarding parental leave, gender equity and sexual harassment in the workplace. In 2016, she was awarded the title of Officer of the Order of Australia for outstanding services to improving the quality of women's working lives. While I cannot do justice to Marion's impressive biography with this short introduction, um, I will just finish by saying that um, she's um, one of those publicly engaged academics who delivers high quality research uh, for social change. So it is very fitting that we have her here with us today to talk about working arrangements and COVID-19 um, and what the future will look like, a topic that is certainly of interest for all of us whether we are academics, policymakers, or practitioners uh, in this space. So thank you very much for uh, being with us uh, and sharing your, your insights. Marianne, over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Eleanor. And um, Jill, thank you. Lovely to see you there. I can't see everyone else, but I, I'd like to wish you a very good morning to all our friends and colleagues in the UK and other countries in the Northern Hemisphere. And good evening to all my friends who are joining in from Australia. Uh, before I begin, I will um, do what is customary um, at our university in Australia, and that is to acknowledge country. The University of Sydney is built on the lands of the Gadigal people, and they are people who belong to what we call the Eora Nation, which um, goes from Sydney Harbour, for those of you who have been here, to the north to Palm Beach to the west to the Blue Mountains and the south to Botany Bay. So it's the big, um, if you like, the basin that Sydney is on. Um, so we do acknowledge uh, that um, our Aboriginal 
um, friends are custodians of this land and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So this evening, I am absolutely delighted to be presenting to you um, some research that uh, I did through 2020. But of course, I didn't do it alone. And I have a number of research collaborators. And this evening's presentation, or this morning's presentation, uh, is, is my way of sort of reflecting on the research that we undertook in 2020 across um, a few areas all related to employment, but regulation, the gender contract at home, and what was happening in workplaces in terms of working from home. And I, so what I'm bringing to you today is not just one research project, but a compilation of that research. So of course, um, any opinions and mistakes that I, that I may um, lead to tonight are my own and so to other conclusions. But I do want to thank my collaborators, many of whom um, are on Zoom with us tonight. You've already seen the abstract, so I, I really sort of summarise what I'm looking at. Um, in particular, I am looking at employee and employer responses. And I do make um, a qualification here that we know that there is, you know, a definitional difference between employees and workers. And in some cases, I am referring to employees as they're legally defined in Australia and at other times, workers more generally. Um, and for the purposes of tonight, though, I think we can just think about those people who are in the labour market and employed. Um, the, the four main studies are on the slide before you, and I think we're circulating the slides later, so you'll be able to go to those documents. Uh, the first is one I did with Elizabeth Hill, uh, where we looked at women's economic participation in Southeast Asia. But this was a paper we did that was a preliminary to that other research for um, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade here, which was to do a rapid um, literature review on the impact of pandemics and economic recessions on women's economic participation. The second one is a paper I did with my PhD student, Daniel Denali, which was commissioned by the Fair Work Commission, that's our major regulatory body in Australia, who asked us to look at preferences for flexible working arrangements before, during and after COVID. Um, and I'll come to that and much of the, many of the graphs in the presentation come from that paper. The third one is one that we did for a major superannuation investment fund. Um, and I'm sure that there have been similar debates in the UK and elsewhere about building back better. Um, and that paper is, is an attempt to say, look, there's another way of, of looking at economic reinvestment and recovery, and we can do that with a gender lens. That paper isn't available publicly just yet. And the fourth one is one I did with my colleagues in the Centre of Excellence on Population Aging Research, which was a, a qualitative study of um, employers' responses to COVID-19. So Myra Hamilton, my senior research fellow, Lisa Gulasarian, another PhD student, Alison Williams, a research assistant, and Sharon Parker is a professor at Curtin University. So they form largely the content, if you like, but I've supplemented the, what I'm saying with um, other materials that have been coming through. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with this whole area of COVID. It's a very dynamic space and there is a lot of research that is underway or is just being published on a daily basis. There's also, of course, a lot of government reporting, media reporting. And so um, I try and build that in where I think it's relevant. To begin with, though, I want to show you what the labour market looks like in Australia. And just to um, cover off on that notion that we, at the beginning of COVID, there was a lot of discussion about how it really hit women hardest and um, that they were most impacted by the recession that followed the pandemics, um, uh, the pandemic and government responses to dealing with the pandemic. And uh, the, in Australia, there was a lot of discussion about it being a pink recession or a, a she session. And we can see that in those early months, women's employment, which is the orange line, um, 
and women's hours of work were more negatively impacted than men's. And so those sort of early months, March through to June, uh, women definitely had a, there was a much more severe impact on women's employment in Australia. Um, it had another dip in July. And then coming through August and September, we see a sort of um, emerging or convergence of men's and women's employment patterns. And of course, this is not a very stable relationship at the moment. And we, depending on which industries are open and which industries are coming back faster than others, we're going to see this pattern um, continue. But what um, Liz and I um, concluded from our literature review, which I'll go on to next, is that it's very important to um, watch women's employment patterns, not just in the short term, but for the longer term. And that following recessions, a terrific meta-analysis has shown that three years after is really where you see the biggest, or will see an impact, but it will continue for up to seven years, potentially. And so this, I suppose, is a warning to us to remember that although we're feeling the impact of COVID now, and we did last year, it probably will continue for some time. So what does the literature, and I, I will go through this very briefly, what does the literature say about um, pandemics, health crises on women's employment? And interestingly, this is a smaller sector of literature. And of course, they're perhaps not surprisingly because of where pandemics have occurred in the past, such as Ebola and SARS and Zika virus, that um, there's not as much information about the effect of health crises on women in more, more developed or Western nations. But we do know that that research that has happened in that area shows, as we saw in COVID, that women are disproportionately employed in the health sector and frontline jobs, and that they are the ones who immediately um, both have to respond to the health crisis, but may also um, be most impacted in terms of unemployment down the track. We see that they're vulnerable to infection, those jobs typically because of the way in which labour markets are seg segmented and women's work has been valued. They're usually low wage work. There's a lot of work health and safety concerns. Um, those women are often also undertaking care duties for the sick at home, which may lead to a loss of employment to them. And overall, there is a general policy of failure to address the specific needs of women or to engage them in the development of official responses to health crises. And we particularly saw that in some countries around the world where even the, um, the provision of protective, personal protective equipment wasn't enough for women or was not of the right style for women. So this is a serious problem and one that, you know, I think we really must address should another health crisis come. Secondly, um, what do we know about economic crises? And of course, COVID is an exceptional situation because it was actually a health crisis that governments then responded to by closing down certain sections of their economies. And that is what led to the economic recession. And so if you look at the much larger literature on women and economic recessions, we can see that economic recessions negatively impact women's economic well-being, they exacerbate existing gender equalities and typically set gender equality back. Um, we also know, as I mentioned before, that the negative impacts last a long time and may last um, for up to seven years after the end of the crisis. But it's more than an economic crisis um, that women's equality in political representation, access to good health services and education will also be impa impacted. And that these multiple, when you have multiple crises, um, such as a health crisis, an economic crisis, a banking crisis, et cetera, you do get this um, compounding effect. So the predictions from the literature for women's equality are not good. And I, I mean, I'd be, Pleased to say is the wrong way to put this, but there was a lot of attention and awareness of this potential um, to the COVID situation in Australia. I'm not saying that we responded to all of these um, negative implications, but there was certainly awareness that they were happening or could happen. 
So I just thought I might give you, for the benefit of um, those who are not in Australia, a very, very quick run through of what the situation about work and employment and industrial relations was in Australia pre-COVID. Uh, because this becomes relevant to understanding what's happening through COVID and post COVID. So pre COVID, we had ongoing debates um, on the problem of low wage growth in Australia of wage theft, underpayment and a lack of enforcement of the rules of our system, a significant decline in enterprise bargaining that is a is collective agreement making between unions and um, employers very low strike activity, declining levels of unionisation, but that unionisation where it happens is feminising, low productivity growth, a lot of concern about the casualisation of our workforce and the growing number of gig or platform workers and the lack of regulation of that work. A typical household in Australia would now be the one plus, that is one full-time breadwinner winner and one part-time breadwinner typically male and female, but not always so. We have what I've called for a shorthand, a moderate paid parental leave scheme in Australia and very expensive childcare, um, and also not very, um, not comprehensive across the country. In that situation, ongoing arguments with employers saying that the rules of the system were too inflexible and the system we work under, our what's called our Fair Work Act, which is our primary piece of legislation, labour law legislation, that the system was too complex. On the other hand, unions were saying the rules were too flexible for employers and that the system was broken and that this actually led to a very strong campaign by the Australian Council of Trade Unions in the lead up to the last election, federal election in May 2019 their campaign was called Change the Rules. And that was gathering some momentum because as we could see around casualization and gig work, the current system is not working and nor were we getting wage growth through bargaining. Uh, now, all of that's very important in a sort of systemic understanding, but the other thing that was happening maybe ahead of the regulatory system was that major corporates in Australia and many of the public sector groupings at the state level and federal were quickly moving to what they were calling an all roles flex policy that flexible work should be available to all people. And it was up to managers and employers to say why it wasn't available if an employee, excuse me, requested it. Um, now, a little bit of background on our timeline. I, I know that we're in a, a different situation to most of Europe at the moment and the UK. I can only say that where we're really way behind is in our vaccination rollout. So um, we're not doing very well in that area. But in terms of um, COVID, we've, we have to a degree come out of COVID. Uh, at the moment, I'm on campus. The university is open, indeed has been open for the last, well, all through 2020 as well. We have face-to-face -face classes again. Our lectures are all online, but um, we are mixing generally dinners. I've just come back from a function to farewell our Workplace Gender Equality Agency um, director. So to all intents and purposes, in many ways, life feels like it could be like it was before. But of course, we've been through 12 to 15 months of a very different period. So that timeline is up there for you and I, I don't need to go through all of the aspects. I want to pull out the main um, regulatory ones that importantly in March last year, non-essential services in many schools were closed. Now that led to the need for people, workers and employers to consider how they were going to um, continue operating. The Fair Work Commission, our primary tribunal for work, approved a process where um, awards could begin to be varied. And the first one was changes to the hospitality award. Um, the government, the federal government did introduce free childcare for a period of time. Um, that was received with a great deal of um, gratitude from parents, but also an expectation that it should continue. We had what was called a, a job keeper wage subsidy scheme 
that was to enable employers to keep their workers on if their revenues dropped be below a certain amount. And in April, the Fair Work Commission introduced two weeks of unpaid pandemic leave um, to cover a lot of workers in Australia, that 102 awards, they are industry-based awards. That's our minimum standards in industry awards. Um, and in July 2020, the Fair Work Commission approved two weeks of paid pandemic leave for healthcare and social service workers. So those frontline workers, majority of them women, who need to self-isolate if they had contracted COVID because they're working in aged care facilities, hospitals, or um, community health, for example, but that has just recently ended. And just to give you a sense of where I am in Sydney in New South Wales, we are in a situation now where the um, restrictions are for gatherings, two square metres per person rule. So for most cases, theatres, restaurants, um, rugby games, soccer games, all sorts of sport activities tend to be running as they did before. So what did we learn from COVID and how has it maybe changed our view of flexibility? Well, for the first part of this, I want to refer to the work that um, Daniel and I did for this research report that was commissioned by the Fair Work Commission. And I think this is interesting to understand the background to this report. Um, the Fair Work Commission at the time, the president of that commission, was sitting on a, what we call a bench to um, examine whether the terms of the Clark's Award, and these awards set the minimum pay and conditions for an industry, then on top of that you can have enterprise bargaining, which supplements those minimum conditions. Um, but what is what some of the key things in in awards are this, this notion of what is the spread of ordinary hours? What is an ordinary day's work? Is it 9 a.m. to 5 p.m.? Is it 8 a.m. to 7 p.m.? Now, of course, you can see why this becomes relevant because during COVID, people who were working from home were often working at 10 p.m., 11 p.m., 9 p.m. at night, which is outside the spread of their ordinary hours as per the award which would lead to a different set of payments. It may lead to um, breaches of the award because they're not working to their regulated hours. So um, the main employers and the main union, the, or the main peak body of the unions had agreed to certain changes to this award. But what the commission wanted to know was, well, what, what do Australian workers actually want? What sort of flexibility are they looking for um, as we come out of COVID and we have to go back and rethink these awards. So the Commission asked us to look at three types of flexibility, working from home, WFH, compressed working week and job sharing. And of course, the thing about COVID was that this wasn't necessarily a choice of either employees or employers to work from home, but it was a government direction that people were not allowed to go into work or to commute to work and where possible should be carrying work on from, should be doing their work from home all day, every day, whether or not they wanted to and whether or not they had children at home because they couldn't send them to school, other family members or household members at home at the same time. So quite a different situation to introduce working from home which led us to find out, well, what do we know about working from home as a form of flexibility? And perhaps not surprisingly, there's not a lot written about working from home. In the 70s and 80s, there was quite a lot about teleworking and that term was used. But more recently, flexibility has not paid that much attention to this concept of working from home. And this is data from our employee relations survey conducted in 2014, so it is pre considerably pre-COVID, but it does give a sense that the notion of a an arrangement where you regularly work from home was the least common of the flexibility arrangements in Australia. And only 11% of employers or enterprises that were surveyed um, offered or made this available. And that doesn't tell us who actually used it. And you could, I'm sure, um, quite genuinely um, hypothesised that a much smaller proportion of people were actually using that um, provision to work from home. So working from home was not widespread. 
I hope you can see this, but the picture is sort of what we want to get to. Um, during COVID, a number of surveys were undertaken and Daniel and I looked at all those surveys and reports and tried to draw out the common themes. Now, this particular study um, done by colleagues here at the University of Sydney Business School, they are interested in commute times, they're transport study workers, and commute times became a very important aspect of um, relieving tension, because if you're not commuting, there's a lot of time freed up in your working day. And for workers in Sydney, a, a commute could easily be 60 minutes to 90 minutes to two hours there to and from work. So um, this is just a range of results. And if we want to look at preferences, we see that um, nearly two thirds of workers would prefer, or over two thirds of workers would prefer to work from home in the future. So there is a sense that they would like to do more of that. Um, the question, of course, from an employer and economic perspective is, are people as productive when they're working at home? And this is self-reports, but this is people saying, are they about, as about, about the same in their productivity, a little more productive or a lot more productive? And here you can see about two thirds are as productive or more productive. So certainly the, these um, workers responding to this survey didn't feel that their productivity had declined substantially. Um, through COVID. And here I'm referring to another study. This was done by colleagues who are at, um, in, at Queensland uh, QUT and, um, Can and University of New South Wales in Canberra. Um, Sue Williamson and Linda Colley looked at public servants in Australia and studied them. And um, they got a huge response to their survey, over 6,000 respondents workers, employees, and one and a half thousand managers. And again, we're getting this report that um, two thirds of, work, of the workforce were feeling that they were getting more work done. If we take that as a, um, a proxy for more productive, they were more productive at home, they definitely had more autonomy, and they were undertaking more complex, complex tasks. And nicely in their study, there is a disaggregation by gender, female and male respondents. They also, excuse me, they also asked um, the managers about their perceptions of their workforce and their productivity or team performance at home. And for those managers, nearly 60% are saying at least about the same in productivity, um, a smaller proportion saying that they are about 30% in total was saying they are more productive. So certainly there was a sense that being at home and working from home wasn't making people necessarily unproductive. But of course we do know that not everybody could work from home, going back to those early slides about the way in which the labour market is segmented. A lot of work has to be done um, and it requires people to leave the home to do that work, especially in a health crisis. There's a greater demand on caring um, and um, personal services. And we can see in this graph, this was work done by the Centre for Work Futures at the Australia Institute um, they estimated using um, ABS data, who was Australian Bureau of Statistics data, who could work from home. And here we see clerical and administrative, hence the emphasis on the Clark's Award, more than 50% are working from or working from home, professionals and managers working from home, um, but sales workers, technicians and trades and community and personal services, much less likely to be working from home. So it the impact of COVID was certainly not uniform and not all workers had the opportunity to work from home. I'm coming to the end of my, well, I've got a few more slides on data, but I'm trying to build this picture for you. Here's another large survey that was undertaken for the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. And I think what's interesting in this, in this survey is that the um, respondents were asked 
What was their access to flexible working arrangements before COVID, during COVID, and what did they want after COVID? And if you look at what happened during COVID, in fact, access to flex flexibility declined except for working from home remotely um, on all work days. So um, COVID certainly wasn't a period of greater flexibility, except for one area where forced working from home occurred. And um, this is what people would prefer to have. And we can see here that the starred ones are the biggest shifts they would like, the ability to choose hours of work, the ability to choose work days, and the ability to compress the full working day, week into fewer days. And for me, those results are interesting because they're all about worker autonomy. And so these respondents um, are really saying they want more worker autonomy post COVID if they could get it. Back to the, the um, transport studies um, survey. This survey also asked, okay, how many days would you like to work from home in the future? And again, what's important here is to see that not everyone is saying they want to work from home in the future. And in fact, almost 40% of respondents don't want to work any days at home in the future. Then we get two other little peaks, a group who want to work two days at home in the future, and another group who do want to work almost full time or full time five days a week at home. It's about 14% and 16%. So the, the picture is not uniform. Not everybody wants to work from home. And in our study of mature workers, classified as 45 and above, um, we found that uh, a large proportion of older workers, 44.1%, 44 did not want to work from home more than they were during COVID. So they may want to work sometime at home, but they certainly don't want to go to working from home as, as a normal pattern. And finally, almost, um, do employees think that their employers will let them work from home in the future or, ha or have more flexible working arrangements? Well, on the whole, men are more positive about what they think their employers will let them do. 55% think they'll be a little or more open to it. And notice the bigger group is a little more open to it. 52% of women thought um, employers would be a little or more open to more flexibility. So there certainly wasn't a sense that we are moving from a COVID flexible environment to a future where flexibility is going to last. Uh, I'll just move on. So what do we know from summarizing that research? I think these are the important takeaways for me. Not all workers want to work from home. The surveys that were conducted point to worker preferences for increased flexibility. Workers do want more flexibility. They especially want to choose the hours they work and the days they work, but the exact nature of what that working week would look like is really still unclear. There's a lot of chatter in the press about two days at home, three days at work, but there's really no firm evidence that that is happening or will happening will happen as yet. And I think that the further we move away from those COVID restrictions in Sydney, particularly and in Australia more generally, um, I think we'll see less emphasis on flexibility. And indeed already um, some of the tip, usually male business leaders are calling for us to get back to the office. Um, and if you look at the commuting data, it's really rapidly increasing. So people are returning to the city to work. Um, the other thing we see is that employer acceptance of a wider range of flexibility for employees is fairly limited. Not all employers are going to say, okay, all roles flex, even though we've had that discourse and narrative building up pre-COVID. And what I would say, um, having gone through many, many surveys, is that we have to really ask for sex disaggregated um, data. Not all surveys provide that. And we are really interested in the different impacts on age, occupation and industry. And really a lot more research needs to be done around targeted groups. So there's plenty of opportunity for research, I can say that. Um, 
We also need to know much more about what employers were responding and doing post it during COVID and what we thought or they thought they might do after COVID. So having gone through a lot of those surveys, we realised that very few surveys were actually asking the employers what they were doing. So we developed um, at fairly short notice a qualitative survey. So that by no means have we interviewed every employer in Australia. And of course, when you do qualitative work and you're calling for people to come to um, be interviewed, um, usually it is the better practice uh, cases who will open up and be interested. So um, I have some caveats around this report, but I think it's a really interesting report and it's available on our website, website an employer lens on COVID. And we interviewed a number of employers and asked them how they were going, what they were doing and what was the future. And on the whole, um, they did see COVID as a catalyst to think about flexibility differently. Um, and they certainly responded quickly. And there was a sense of um, a need to respond because of the community health need. So um, employers were quite um, responsive to the need to be flexible and they were concerned about the health risks and they very quickly moved to shifting stop and start times um, setting up offices where people could go to work with a different setup, much more um, refined hygiene protocols everywhere, and continually calculating occupancy percentages in lifts and floors, staggering break times if people were returning to work, etc. Um, we were asking this because we were concerned that older employer employees would be discriminated against through COVID and would not be able to cope with the changes in the use of technology and what were employers thinking about that. Interestingly, what we found was that employers who we interviewed were much more concerned about younger employees who did not have access to good spaces at home, who were maybe sharing in share houses um, and working under more difficult situations and were socially isolated. So employers were more worried about them. Their older employees on the whole, unless they had a medical condition, seemed to cope very quickly and easily with the change and, the, and taking up working from home technologies. Um, many were open to more flexible working arrangements post COVID, including higher levels of working from home but they are really giving this a lot of consideration and they do identify certain problems. Um, they spoke about the lack of team cohesion if people are working from home, barriers to appropriate information sharing, that it's not appropriate for all employees, that they may need to somehow manage middle management um, resistance to um, having to manage people working from home and also how to manage worker resistance to being in the office if they call people back. Um, and so for managers, and I think this is a theme coming through in a lot of what we hear in a qualitative sense, is that they're not that equipped to manage working from home workforces on a large scale or an ongoing um, or in an ongoing way. Now, the other thing I was interested in um, was, did the gender contract change at home? And, you know, the early, the early news reports were glowing, as you can see, magical moments, how COVID-19 will supercharge family-friendly work for good. And so there was a sort of a lot of commentary hoping that and willing that the experience of dads being at home and in that initial lockdown, I would look out my window, I've never seen so many fathers um, pushing kids on in strollers or little scooters or with bikes because it happened to be beautiful weather in Sydney this time last year. And I think the lockdown was a little bit of a, a sort of a, an enforced break and holiday, even though they were working from home. So there was this sort of enthusiasm about the new way of working. Um, Myra Hamilton, who I work with here and myself, we wrote an, an op-ed to sort of be a little bit hold on it's not all that good and working from home is nothing new to mothers who we know from our other research 
often only get paid for three or four days a week, but because they need that flexibility, but they usually do work from home on those other days as well to keep up with the work and to ensure that their careers don't go completely off the rails. So, you know, we had on the one hand this notion that it's fantastic opportunity, um, the gender contract at home would change. However, the, the data coming in is actually slightly different. Um, Lynn Craig and Brendan Churchill at Melbourne University have done a couple of surveys. And what they found was that um, men experienced actually an increase in subjective pressure when they're working from home. So these men who were looking after the children in the domestic sphere and working, as women often do, reported actually feeling quite pressured and stressed for time. For women, it was a slight decrease. So what, we were ha what was happening is that the um, convergence of women's and men's feelings of stress and pressure. For women, what was often um, commented on, they didn't have to drive children to after school activities and they didn't have to commute to work. And that really relieved a lot of the pressure on them. So um, will, did the gender contract change and will it remain change? I'm skeptical that it changed much and I'm even more skeptical that it will remain changed in the future. There may be some glimmers of hopes. Um, my other area of interest uh, is regulation. And I think what was very interesting during COVID is that we saw, um, certainly as researchers, the importance of institutions again, and that this award system we have in Australia that has been um, almost a forgotten aspect, I may be overstating it, but awards during the enterprise bargaining period were, were minimum, they're minimum standards and they were sort of there, but people didn't pay a lot of attention to them. They really came into their own during, during COVID because the Fair Work Commission can rule on awards. It requires employers and employees to come to them about enterprise agreements. So the institution of the Fair Work Commission could begin to make some changes to awards. And as we saw, they did include paid, pan paid pandemic leave in the health sector awards. There was more flexibility around the taking of leave, but um, the awards were also changed to enable employers to give a lot more direction to employees during COVID, for example, to perform all duties within their skill and competency as directed by the employer, for the employer to um, direct an employee to work at a different workplace, including the employee's home, an employer could give direction to employees to stagger their start and finishing times. So um, there was some opposition from the ACTU, the peak union body, to letting these employer discretions actually continue for too long. Uh, the commission did also bring in a process that enabled enterprise agreements to be varied a bit more promptly than usual to accommodate um, the challenges of the pandemic. And through this period, the federal government also embarked on something they had been wanting to do for some time, you could argue, that is change our Fair Work Act. And the X now, you may have heard of the scandal around our former Minister for Industrial Relations and Attorney General, Christian Porter, he set up five working groups to deliver fair and workable solutions to the problems that threaten to hold back our economic recovery. So you can see that midway through last year, 2020, um, the government was starting to think about or really working towards the recovery and using perhaps COVID as a bit of an excuse to come and um, make that system that employers find too rigid, too, flex, too inflexible to make it more open to employers. Not surprisingly, the unions um, were not that happy about this, but um, unions and employers were each on these five working parties to look at casual employment, award simplification, agreement making, compliance and enforcement, and a very special thing we have in Australia here, extended terms for greenfields agreements. These are usually large mining or extractive industry agreements to give them a longer period of time to plan and for those agreements without having to change the workforce entitlements or pay. 
So that all happened and it's always been a very controversial area in Australia to embark on industrial relations reform. And in fact, the only two prime ministers that have lost their seats in elections have been those who have tried to do this during an election campaign. Um, what happened? Well, in the end, by the 9th of December, um, a new omnibus bill was put to, to Parliament, the Fair Work Amendment Bill, supporting Australia's jobs and economic recovery. And I thank Francis Flanagan, my colleague here, for doing a lovely timeline of what happened during COVID. Um, and that, that bill tried to make some quite extensive changes to our Fair Work Act. I won't go through the details. The point is that I think regulation is still very important and um, governments do try and use moments of opportunity, um, depending on which political persuasion they are. And our current government is a conservative government um, and really supports the employers on the whole. So in the end, uh, that omnibus bill did not get through in its entirety. There was a lot of opposition to particular parts of it. And the only bit that really passed or that they allowed to pass in the end was provisions relating to how a casual worker is defined. We can go into that in questions if you're interested. So two conclusions. What do I draw out from all of this? Um, in terms of flexibility for the future and preferences, I think we have to remember that there are very significant labour market divisions in all of our economies. Not everyone is treated equally and um, a health pandemic really highlights that, the difference between essential workers and non-essential workers and who, who is on the front line. And of course, in health pandemics, because of the structure of industries and occupations, it's often women. Um, COVID threw up working from home as an option that we really didn't, um, I think, canvas that much at all before COVID. There was always perhaps I could work at an informal arrangement, work from home a day a week if you had a good supervisor. But as a sort of a standard practice, as we saw from the data, not that widely known. But the data do show that um, employees and workers are interested in the concept of the compressed working week. And just before, like literally the two weeks before COVID began, I was about to start a project on the four day working week, which then got shelved because of COVID. And this notion of job share may come back on the agenda. Um, I do speculate there's a, a tentative emergence of a hybrid, a hybrid work, working week for white collar workers, but there's really not a lot of hard data on that yet. Um, and I think we're yet to see working from home, compressed working week or job sharing changes formalized across the board. It's still in very embryonic phases. Perceived productivity during COVID was the same or better. But I would also argue that that may have been maybe a bit of a honeymoon period, a novel experience. Um, and we will need to gather data and watch the longer term to see if that trend continues. And I do think COVID, particularly in Australia, did raise questions about managerial capacity to manage a hybrid working week and particularly to understand the gender um, implications and implications for people's careers especially if you have an intersectional view of gender um, and other um, diversity indicators and those people working from home could lead to a fairly um, disadvantageous mix for careers. Uh, in terms of the gender contract, I don't think that the shift in the, the gender contract that we saw happen for a short while during COVID would, is permanent. Um, that it was a shock for fathers, and that comes through in the data, that having to deal with working from home and children, um, especially if they were having school lessons at home as well. And I don't think we can underestimate the power of the status quo or tradition when it comes to the gender contract. Will the gender contract change at work? Now, this is a really interesting one, especially as now in Australia, as soon as we've come out of sort of a bit of a, a stressful COVID period, we have enormous um, stress around gender equality and the treatment of women in workplaces around Australia. So that's sort of overshadowing whatever changes might have happened through COVID. Commute times become very important, especially for women. 
and um, policy supports. COVID really showed that childcare was critical to balancing work and family and to feeling more satisfied with the arrangements. And that really does affect women's preferences to work from home. And there is some suggestion that some women having experienced that extra childcare or that ability to work from home and not have all the other stresses may, if they have to go back to work on a regular basis, prefer to work for, stay at home and not work if they have to work under more traditional arrangements. And in terms of regulation in Australia, I'd argue that COVID really demonstrated the relevance of the underlying award system and the role of the Fair Work Commission. Um, not everyone will be happy with the decisions, but um, some very important decisions were made. But we're still in a situation where there is, a dis there is disagreement about what appropriate systemic changes should be made and particularly around this issue of span of hours, it's a good example, where the employers want a wider span of hours for the regular work day and the union movement argues it should be shorter. But in the end, changes to legislation were minimal. And having gone through all of that, we still are very uncertain about the use of and impact of formal rights to request flexib flexibility, which are available in our Fair Work Act, versus informal flexibility provisions, which we know are widespread, but we don't collect data on that. Um, and that is the next research project that we're just about to begin, is to get a better sense of how are those formal provisions in the Fair Work Act actually being used. So um, I'll end there, and I hope that I've given you some food for thought, and I really look forward to questions and thank um, Cred and all my colleagues at Queen Mary for giving me the opportunity to talk to you tonight. Thanks so much, Marion. That was so interesting and so many different aspects to uh, life and work under the pandemic that you have brought out in that presentation. Um, and I know that um, I, uh, there's already some really interesting questions coming in. So although I've got okay. a lot of questions, of my own that I could ask okay. you. <laughs> I'm going to hand it over in, in a sense to the participants and, um, and ask you to address some of the questions that have already come in. And then please, you know, other participants, please do put your questions in the Q&A. And um, we have about, I think, 20 minutes for questions and answers now. And so I'll go straight away to the first one, Sarah Abbott. Um, has asked, has there been any research into the effect of increased working from home on innovation? Has innovation been affected while we were all working from home full time? Mm. Thanks, Sarah, and hi. Um, I didn't cover that in my presentation. We did do a bit of, we looked into that a little bit in our um, survey of employers, but I I wouldn't say there's been a huge, not in the areas I'm familiar with, there hasn't been a lot of attention to innovation. But I do think this is an area worth investigating. And it's one that, you know, it's been on my mind because we do know that what happened during COVID when people were forced to work from home, employers had to respond with tech, new technologies and enable people to take technology home, which in the past they hadn't been allowed to do. So, um, I, I haven't got an answer. I just think that's a really interesting question and something we do need to follow up on. I'm not even sure how we do that yet. So if anyone's got any thoughts on that, I'd be eager to hear that. Thanks, Marianne. Yeah, so it's a really interesting question, isn't it? And it's yeah. um, something that it's hard to wrap your head around how you would investigate that, a bit like trying to show the diversity innovation link that is claimed, but yet you know, it's really hard to prove. Yeah, I I mean, from a, I could speak from a university point of view. I mean, that's, you know, sometimes it's a good idea to start with your own work environment, isn't it? We've certainly innovated in our teaching, you know, and I'm sure all my colleagues at universities around the world will be thinking the same. You know, if you think about the way in which we teach now online, uh, the way in which we assess um, the different things we've done to make people more engaged with how we do it, how we've collaborated with our colleagues. I think in, uh, um, 
in a stronger way than we did before because we're, we interview them now and we have podcasts and we have videos. And I think one of my wonderful colleagues, Maria Ishkova, who does a lot of work in this area, would say that this has forced us to innovate in terms of educational provision. I wouldn't say it's been easy and um, it's certainly more time consuming for many people, but there have been innovations. I'm not even sure if we're measuring that in the university though. So on a slightly different topic, uh, Renu Gupta has asked the slide which showed the proportion of people who don't want to work from home in future. Do you have any idea of the gender distribution of that? I don't, Renu, and that's exactly the problem. You know, as I looked at these surveys, uh, I thought, oh, why didn't they ask or break? I don't have that data to ask those people or to ask the analysts to say what what was the distribution between men and women. I might find though, I know those researchers, I'll ask them if they gathered that demographic data initially, which they would have done, and I don't know why they don't present it. And so I think that's one of the lessons for me is that sort of, it's really critical to know which, what groups of people are, are wanting what in their preferences. And that's a huge lesson. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, Susan Milner is interested in um, the, the context section where you talked about initiatives on childcare. So how have these debates developed in Australia and how do the debates you presented regarding working hours and, and flexibility relate to this? Does the idea that there will be more um, working from home, <laughs> sorry. I didn't get the acronym for a moment, the more working from home lead to the assumption that the childcare issue is fixed, resolved. Yeah, look, I would say no one in Australia, except maybe the Prime Minister at the moment, I don't know, would think that the childcare system is fixed. It, it's any working woman and most working parents would say it's not fixed and it's expensive it's um, difficult to access. It doesn't fit our working patterns. The funding model is wrong. The privatisation of it is wrong. So look, no one thinks it's fixed. I think, and I've got a good colleague who I think is online, Liz Hill would say, it's just not fixed. Did, what happened through COVID is that when it was paid for by the federal government and open and everyone could access it that way, it was brilliant. And people said, why can't we have it like this all the time? So COVID really did sort of say childcare is a huge issue and we have to do it better. Unfortunately, we have a budget coming down in two weeks and none of the leaks are, are, are pointing to a new childcare system. So I, I think this is an ongoing problem and it really is the major impediment to women's participation and satisfaction with their work-life balance. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have the impression that some men have, during this pandemic, one lesson that they've learned, some fathers, is that you can't look after children and fully work <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> and that's maybe a good lesson, but maybe the Prime Minister of Australia hasn't learned that. I think, um, I mean, I think that's interesting in Lynn Craig's research is that her data does show that men's men's sense of being rushed and pressed for time, you know, the classic indicator, re and their stress levels grew while they were working from home. So uh, but women's dropped so marginally, but, you know, even though um, everyone was carrying a higher domestic load. So, yeah, I do, I do think that gives you a bit of a sense of people are more aware of the problem, but that doesn't mean at a policy level there's been a real answer to that yet. Absolutely. So um, Tego Maharapara is asking about um, productivity and could you speculate as to why employees are reporting the same or more productivity? Could it be more than just autonomy? Do they have a supportive home environment? No kids? Dual or multiple career household? So let <laughs> me start yeah. with that. Yeah, that's a really interesting question, Tego. And the data that we have to date don't give us enough information on that. Just as um, uh, who, I think it was Ren, 
um, yeah, Renu, who asked about sex, gender and working from home preferences, we don't have the information on what their setups were like. Did they have children, supportive home environment, dual multiple career, household, etc. So it's hard to know. It's hard to know. And I think that's something we really do need to somehow investigate. Um, it will be interesting to see if productivity measures change over the next couple of years. And if we can relate that back to shifts in, in practices during COVID, I don't know. Certainly people talked about less distractions at home and they were able to concentrate and worked harder. Um, contrary to what some of our employers thought might happen. So our employers in that qualitative study were, um, were not dismissive of the productivity and were saying, yes, people are working, even when they, where there were some who, were, who thought it wouldn't work and were, were a bit reluctant to allow so much working from home, they, um, they did see the benefits of it. Look, and as I said, I wonder if it will continue and that's another thing to consider, you know, for a period of time, you can work alone, perhaps more isolated, but at, at, at another time, perhaps you do need to come together to um, work. And so that will be the, I think that's the management um, issue that has to be resolved. How do we manage what's starting to be called the hybrid working teams and hybrid working arrangements? It could be really complex, couldn't it? And, and I wonder whether there is sufficient managerial will as well as competence to do that. Yeah. I, well, I will tell. Yeah, exactly. Um, so Ian Ropers says this was very interesting and yes. points to the fact that we're all speculating in the UK what the new normal might look like and that Australia seems to offer what this could look like. Um, less different than may have been suggested. So are there employers who are keen to go fully or mostly to working from home? And are there, are there employees who are worried about what this might mean for them? Yeah, hi Ian. I think exactly that debate is what we were having in Australia last year, that we we're all entering a new normal. Um, but I don't think the new normal is that much different to what we were before. I think what we have done is experienced an opportunity for a different arrangement, but whether that will be maintained, um, the indicators to me are that it won't be as big a shift. Now, I might be more pessimist or it depends how, whether you think that's good or bad. I think there are a couple of drivers that I see happening at the moment. One is real estate. You know, the owners of all the big office blocks and the people who rent them and the companies that are landlords to those um, office blocks are really encouraging people to get back to work. So there's a whole sense of um, there's all this real estate that's empty, it's been built for offices, what are we going to do about that? We need people back in the city. We need to get business again in, in those sort of city environments, all those um, aggregates, aggregations of people to boost the economy. Um, there is some talk about converting all those big office buildings in our CVDs to residences so that some of that might happen. Um, but I think the driver is sort of almost sometimes external to what's happening in our workplaces. Are there employers who are keen to go fully or mostly working from home? I'm not aware of them yet, but some people might be. Um, and I think the data shows that very few people want to do it fully. There are some people who want to fully work from home, but it's not the biggest proportion. And in fact, the bigger proportion is those people who want to work full time at work. So that says to me that, you know, sometimes, um, yeah, the new normal is not going to be as different to the um, old normal as people might have expected. And that on that, the next question from Danul Danula Gamard asks about the childcare gap between men and women and has it fallen due to COVID? So is there a new normal in the home? I think you've probably indicated that there isn't. Yeah, I don't think there is. Um, during COVID, there was a bit of a shift, but it's returning to a more normal arrangement. Uh, we haven't got the latest data on hours that will come out 
of hours spent, you know, by men and women at home. Uh, we've only just really got our surveys on that running again, I think. So I'm not expecting to see a huge shift there. Where it might happen is, I mean, I'm a bit concerned that women may pick up more of the childcare because they may work from, um, this is one of the dangers of COVID that women, it, we may see a return to more traditional patterns where women are the ones who choose to work from home because they felt it was much less pressure to commute and to do all that other stuff around so that they'll stay at home and that will widen the gender gaps um, in domestic responsibilities. To me, that's more likely to happen than men pick up more of the childcare. Yeah, and I, I also wonder if that happens, if it means that women are, become further marginalised in their professional and managerial careers because men are returning to the office and women are outside of all those informal interactions that occur, you know, in a Absolutely. workplace. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I think that's quite likely. And I mean, even I even hear that in general conversations already. So that, you know, I'm not quoting hard research on that, but certainly there is discussion about that and how to deal with that. How should our team leaders, supervisors, managers manage those people, usually women who've continued to work from home? So it's so a couple of um, familiar names for you, Marion. Anne-Marie Green is asking yeah. um, about um, the, the data you've got. So you've got a large amount of data there and working out what it means for concepts and theorization. And she says, I was thinking about potentialities for comparison with UK surveys, for example, of which there's a large number since March 2020, but also starting to think about the theorization. Is this about choice, preference? Does it add to arguments about the total social organization of labor, separation of public private spaces, and all of those kinds of theories that we use in the past? Yeah, thanks, Anne-Marie. I haven't, I, I, first of all, I agree with you. Um, we've got all this data, but one problem I really picked up in, in that, and I had a little note in the slides, is that then they all, there's no consistency in their sampling, in the questions, in the analysis, in the purpose of the survey. So, we're sort of getting insights from all different angles, but it's very hard to compare the results. So really what I tried to do was what were the big, what, what, what was I reading into those results in a way that I could take up to a higher level? But I don't think, I don't, for all those surveys we've got, you can't compare one with the other directly because they ask different questions, they go to different groups of people, went at different times during, you know, surveyed at different times during COVID and lockdown which gives you different responses. So that's, that's a methodological problem, I think, that we have. How to think about it in a theoretical way is really, I, I do think this is a really important one. And um, that's why um, putting all of this together was a chance to start thinking, what do we do with this now? I do feel that it is about, um, what we mean, first of all, I think we have to think much more clearly about what do we mean by flexibility at work? Maybe we have to go back to basics again and think about that flexibility from, as we usually do, the employer side and the employee side. But what is that flexibility now? And then how does that feed over into those two spheres of work and home and the gender contracted in each? And they are, they are so interrelated now that we need, we need a mechanism or a, sort of a, a model to understand that. Um, so that's the public private, the choice and preference. I think they can all go together. The total social organization of labor, that's a really good question, Anne-Marie. And I think I need you to say a little bit more about what, what you're thinking there. Um, maybe offline, but I'm really interested yeah. in that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah no, that does sound interesting. I'd be interested to hear more about that too. So I'm sure there will be opportunities mm, to do can. that. Yeah. So I think what will be the last question, because we're running out of time from Geraldine Healy. Um, so she says that we've, we've seen forms of positive flexibility, at least initially 
within the in the pandemic. Um, but now there seems to be less employee friendly forms and um, forms that are giving employers more autonomy over employees working tasks and extending working hours and is it the future of flexibility? Yeah well I think Geraldine thanks for that question that really goes into these questions about regulation in Australia so I'm I don't know that we've actually got to that point where employers will have more autonomy but they certainly got a bit more during COVID and that's that's where we're at now. And so the next phase is how does this research feed into decisions of the commission where they make these decisions about the, um, those really nuts and bolts of work. How do we define a working day? At what point does the employer have the right to direct workers to work from home or to come into the workplace? And, you know, I think this brings back very old fashioned industrial relations research that is critically needed now. And, and not just in research, but also in practice, you know, we need to be training our students to understand these concepts and how you go about negotiating, arguing a case, bringing these cases to the commission or whatever your equivalent is in the countries that you're in. So um, I'm really sort of excited about that because it's old fashioned research in that very traditional way about how does the system work. And, and I think COVID, to me, COVID's Im important to highlight that those institutions and those arrangements that are made are really important to people's daily work lives. And we forget that, you know, operating individually, but those rules that are select that are set at the collective level, having considered arguments from employers and employees and tried to make sense of the bigger picture. Um, uh, you know, I, I do think, to me, that's fascinating and actually um, central to how we regulate work in, in the post-COVID world, whatever that normal starts to look like. Well, that's a fantastic note to end on, um, Marion. So thanks so much for answering all those questions so comprehensively. And I'll, I'll let Elena Doldor now um, close the, the, the presentation Thanks. in the seminar. Thank you, Maria. Thank you so much, Jill, for moderating the, this Q&A segment. And thank you, Marianne, for sharing all those rich insights. A really fascinating data, but also findings that actually open the appetite for more research, because it, it's yeah. quite obvious we don't have all the answers yet. Um, yeah. One particular point that struck me that would be interesting to, um, is that, um, in, in, to explore further is the international comparison angle that Anne Marie was referring to. And I was wondering to what extent um, some of the attitudes towards flexible working also depend on the severity and length of the lockdowns we have experienced. Exactly. Um, yeah. Clearly the UK situation compared to Australia is um, <laughs> perhaps a lot more, um, um, a lot more stringent in terms of the, the changes we've, we've had to, um, yeah. to, to uh, put up with. So um, I suppose that the, the one silver lining from all this pandemic that I always think about is it's given us the opportunity to scrutinize our assumptions about working pattern and about gender relations at, uh, at home. Um, and I know the, the path to change is not as straightforward as you, as you put it, uh, but I'm, I'm grateful that we are scrutinizing um, these assumptions and practices and having these conversations at societal and, and organizational level. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for the chance to talk to everyone and, and to bring it all together in some way. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you for doing this, um, uh, for, for CRED, and thank you for um, everyone who has attended online. The recording will be posted um, in a few days on our website. Um, and um, I wish you all um, a lovely rest of the week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night.